Welcome back to the open session of the PAC. Uh, sorry for the small delay. The committee had to finish a discussion. We start the presentation with Haiyan Gao, who will present the run group edition for Hall A. Please, Haiyan. Okay, good morning. So I am presenting the Hall A solid run group proposal on a precision measurement of inclusive G2N and D2N with solid. And um, so the proponents uh, of this uh, proposal is Ye Tian from Syracuse and Peng Cao from Argonne. And the review committee members' names are listed here. So let me very briefly just tell you about the review process and also the decision. So we, we did the initial review during solid collaboration meeting on June the 9th. And um, there was a presentation and questions. And um, so, so that was the initial review. And the committee raised a number of uh, questions and comments. And the proponents worked very hard to address all these issues. So we had two follow-up reviews uh, took place on June the 18th and June the 20th. And um, in the end, based on the significance of the proposed physics and the the uh, enhancement of the impact of the SOLID program on neutron spin physics, the committee was very enthusiastic. Uh, in, we, we endorsed the proposal enthusiastically. So let me very briefly to um, tell you about the physics motivation. And um, as, you, as we all know quite well, there are important spin structure functions, G1 and G2. G1 is the one which uh, tells us about the helicity distribution of the uh, uh, spin. And G2, it does not have in the naive quark model, it doesn't have the intuitive physical picture. However, it's actually quite important when you think about if you include the quark transverse momentum and also it carries or allow us to probe a higher twist uh, uh, information such as quark run or interactions. So one can actually, um, in the in the leading twist on um, the uh, uh, the leading twist part of the G2 uh, uh, spin structure function can be related uh, using the uh, um, G1 uh, by uh, uh, when zero and the well check relationship, but it is the difference from the leading twist that gave us the twi higher twist contribution, and which uh, connects to or uh, give us information about the quark gluon um, uh, uh, correlation. And uh, also the third moment of the G2 uh, bar, which is uh, D2N, is uh, very interesting in the sense that it has the kind of nice physical picture, whether it's a color electromagnetic force or color Lorentz force, but it can be calculated on the lattice and it gives us a clean way to access to its three contribution. And also given the weight of X squared, so the higher Q squared data becomes are uh, more uh, important in this case, and the 12 GB is an uh, excellent place to uh, uh, determine, measure this quantity. So how are we are going to do this experiment? It's a parasitic uh, 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 measurement with the already approved solid, uh, some inclusive DIS uh, experiment with polarized helium-3 target, because the focus here is the neutron. And so there are two approved experiments, one with transversely polarized target, one with longitudinally polarized target. So these experiments are single spin asymmetry measurement, but the beam is always longitudinally polarized. So therefore, one can look at double spin asymmetry uh, uh, in this case, and looking at the inclusive uh, double spin asymmetry uh, measurement, both the transversely polarized case, a parallel, and also the, sorry, that's the longitudinal polarized and also the transverse polarized, which is a PERP, as you can see here. And then the spin-dependent parallel and, uh, and the PERP, uh, uh, a transverse spin-dependent cross-section can be determined by the unpolarized cross-section and the double spin asymmetry. And one can determine G1 and G2 in this case. And polarized helium-3, as you have heard this morning, is a very effective polarized neutron target. So how parasitically one can do this experiment in this case, um, so what we are interested in is the inclusive measurement, so it's the singles uh, uh, measurement. So the current uh, uh, proposed and also um, proposed designed data acquisition rate is 100 kilohertz for, for solid CDS program. And the total estimated rate is 85 kilohertz. So you do have 15 kilohertz free uh, trigger space, which will allow one to um, 
use, for example, we can use a pre-scale factor of 10 uh, based on the uh, total uh, single charged particle trigger rate, one can get something like 10 kilohertz, so that can work. But furthermore, one can also use the random coincident trigger to, um, to um, get the information, get the data for the singles for this experiment as well. And I want to mention that um, this is not the first time um, people in solid collaboration wanted to do the inclusive measurement. For example, uh, the already approved round group AY experiment um, ha has gone through the same kind of uh, exercises and that experiment was approved. Okay, so let me very quickly to show you the systematic uh, uncertainty uh, study as well as, yeah, the systematic. As I mentioned that in this case to get G1 and G2, so there is the unpolarized cross-section we need to worry about. There is also the spin dependent uh, asymmetry. So here the systematic uh, are provided in terms of sources as well as the uh, for the cross-section and also for the asymmetry. And the numbers are listed here you can see, and of course, because it's a, a nuclear target, so we have to uh, 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 remove or take care of the nuclear correction, so as well as radio correction. So there is the unfolding procedure as well involved, which also give rise to systematic uh, uncertainties. And finally, the physics uh, in terms of the physics result, and uh, we also provide you uh, what kind of overall uh, systematic asymmetry for the uh, um, uh, cross-section measurement as well as the G2 and the D2 for di two different uh, beam energies. So let me just show you the uh, the projected uh, results and you what have a minute left. So what has been uh, in included on um, the target polarization, 80 55 percent beam polarization, and also nitrogen dilution factor, and we show you both uh, 8.8 .8 and also 11 GV. Uh, uh, projection. The systematics uncertainty I show as the band, and the error bars are the statistical. And um, so there are diff two different kind of uh, triggers. Um, I mentioned one is the dedicated, which is the uh, pre-scaled uh, factor of 10 or uh, singles rate. The other is using the uh, uh, reuse re re the random coincidence trigger. So you can see one is shown as black, the other is red, and the left is 8.8 .8 and right is 11.0 GeV, and you can see with higher beam energy, of course, one can go to much higher Q square. So the projections are shown in terms of Q square and also uh, X beyond gain. So finally, this is the money plot, which show you um, the D2 uh, determination one can uh, achieve from this experiment for both 8.8 .8 GeV blue and also 11 GeV red, together with the existing data, which of course, um, not of course, which uh, show very large uncertainty, but also the uh, 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 approved experiment E1206121, which are shown as the uh, black points. So you can see that um, the proposed solid data will allow us to have a uh, uh, high precision determination of D2, as well as uh, extended range, a kinematic range, compared with uh, the already approved uh, 12 GV uh, Hall C experiment. So this really allow us to take advantage of the 12 GV uh, capability as well as the solid. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. The uh, floor is to the reader of this uh, proposal. That's Matthias Tadekamp. Please, Matthias. Hi, hi, Jan. This is Matthias. Uh, hi. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, I think it's uh, very nice to see uh, with what accuracy uh, SOLID uh, can measure higher twist contribution to uh, G2 uh, by measuring uh, the moment uh, D2, uh, the third moment of uh, G2. And my first question is actually, if I understood the proposal correctly, uh, for the extraction from the data of D2, you're going to rely not on the difference between G2 and uh, G2 von Sora Vilsek, you're going to rely on uh, the 2G1 plus uh, 3G2 um, expression. Um, so if you be, I think on your slide you actually show the, the yes. if you look at uh, the moment, um, the, the right-hand side of that equation uh, can be taken directly from your measurements. Uh, the left-hand side would require first an extraction of G2 WW, and then you would extract that from your measurement. And uh, so the question is, I think, to go from uh, the middle to the right-hand section, 
you have to assume that factorization uh, works and uh, maybe this is uh, fairly good at large x uh, because uh, the sum rule is weighted with x squared and is dominated at large x. But uh, in discussing this, um, I, I think one should consider uh, that uh, factorization maybe not, uh, you know, valid, or maybe there's a transition into the range where it's valid uh, for the measurements that uh, the measurement that solid carries out here. Yeah, I think that's actually a very, very good point. Um, thank you. And indeed, I think that um, with the uh, 11 GV and um, factorization is uh, one important um, aspect, uh, whether it's uh, in hall A or hall B or hall C, maybe particularly in hall C, where you actually can, um, for example, also look at LT separation really help us to uh, determine. But I think this is a unique kinematic region in the sense that you, you are able I think this is actually, in some way, it's also a plus, right? We can really see how this kind of transition happens. You're absolutely right. Okay, and then the next, this is not really a focus in the proposal, uh, but you also will maybe getting the best measurement of the burkhardt cottingham thumb rule. And uh, I'm not an expert. I would like to know how much of the integral is missing at low x. I think you cover from about x.2 uh, to very large x a broad region but you're missing the low x region yeah the low x region is um is missing and um so one will have to um do the extrapolation and then you have to uh, address you know the kind of systematic when you have to extrapolate to the unmeasured region and um the summary you mentioned is uh, also in the proposal and in the interest of time you know i did not you know talk about that in this seven minute presentation i, I right. saw it in the proposal but maybe i didn't read it carefully enough i wonder if there's an estimate uh you know how big the uncertainty is due to the uh low x mm -hmm, mm -hmm. contribution um, yeah i think for that i would like to invite you know one of our young uh proposed uh, spokesperson to answer the question uh a uh, year and how you know maybe one of you can answer matthias question yeah, I think in the proposal we read on um, uh, is uh, we estimate uh, 15 percent on uncertainty. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, so that's actually you know historically speaking, when we measured the Bjorken sum rule first, I think uh, that was roughly that initially. That's interesting too. And then my last question is uh, experimental. I noticed in the uh, TAC uh, report. Uh, there was a question concerning the trigger. Um, they kind of said that in the proposal, it's not quite clear uh, if this is a single electron trigger and then the description of uh, cuts on the hadronic final state is offline or whether these cuts are um, already required uh, in, uh, on, at the online level, at the trigger level uh, to uh, get enough um, selectivity for the physics that's interesting. Yeah, I, we, uh, I, I both Ye and Tao clarify this and what we really meant or what they really meant is the uh, single total single charge particle trigger, which is what the TSA reader was pointed out. So this is all clear now. So it's not just single electron, it's the total charge particle. Oh, so, so you require an electron and a uh, charge hadron in the final state. I believe the PID is not done at the trigger level. The reason why I think this could be important, obviously uh, it would be better to have the least bias possible in the uh, trigger. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you also have to make sure that you have enough selectivity uh, to um, get the physics sample uh, that you require for your certainties that are shown here. Mm -hmm. and I. I if you had to include the, um, I think this would be rejections of certain electronic final states, then then I worry that you um, can study your trigger bias sufficiently. Um, so you need, um, I think you need an unbiased sample that's large enough uh, to study trigger biases with sufficiently small statistical errors. 
Um, yes, I think you are absolutely right. It's like uh, um, so like like fifteen um hertz uh, kilohertz of free space for the uh, single charge triggers. Um, that can like uh, there's a twenty to thirty percent uh, uncertainties there. So, but finally we will get um uh single uh charge triggers. Uh, we can use some commissioning data also. So like uh, yeah, we will um take care of that part to make sure like we have enough statistics uh to study that bears with the single chart trigger events we to we uh, we take actually okay all right thank you uh those were my questions thanks thank you very much then we move on to the next presentation that is for hall d and it will be given by elton smith please elton and again uh you uh, should aim at seven minutes. I will give you a heads up after six minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we do see it. Okay, it should be in full screen mode now. It is perfect. Okay, good morning. I'm gonna tell you about the proposal to measure the polarizability of the neutral pion with Gluex. And this experiment would run concurrently uh, with the measurement for the charged pion polarizability, which has already been approved. So we went through an internal Gluex review and the summary uh, from the review was that the neutral pion polarizability is compatible with the charged pion polarizability, and that the proposed measurements were feasible in the beam time requested. Uh, as of this week, this experiment has been endorsed by the GLUEX collaboration. The polarizability is the ease with which an external field induces a dipole moment in a particle, and is a property that reflects the internal structure of the particle. Uh, up to now, the pi zero polarizability has never been measured, but we can glean kind of the magnitude of the polarizability from measurements of the charge pion. Here I show the measurement from compass, which is two plus or minus 0.9 in units of 10 to the minus four Fermi cubed. And the charge pion polarizability is the uh, target of the uh, CPP experiment, um, which is already approved. Uh, to lowest order and perturbation theory, uh, the Pion polarizability is completely determined, and the electric polarizability is equal in magnitude to the magnetic polarizability, but they're of opposite sign. Requirements for the neutral pion polarizability are very similar to the ones for the charged pion. We need a high Z target uh, because the signal is proportional to Z squared. Uh, we would run at relatively low photon beam energy. Uh, it gives us better acceptance and also higher polarization. And we also need an accurate normalization scheme. Uh, and that's because we're gonna measure an absolute cross section. So the plan is to run concurrently with CPP. Uh, I have a table here um, that illustrates the main uh, properties of the beam, both for GLUEX running and for the charged pion polarizability and the neutral pion polarizability. Uh, the coherent peak would run at a lower energy of like 6 GV and fairly low beam current compared to normal GLUEX. Uh, the target would be a solid lead target, which is upstream of the normal uh, target uh, to increase acceptance. The charge pion polarizability experiment requires the installation of a muon detector uh, behind the calorimeter, so it doesn't really affect the measurement for neutral pion polarizability. One addition that's needed for the uh, neutral pion is a calorimeter trigger. Uh, based on measurements, we estimate the rate to be about 10 kilohertz. And together with the rate for the charge pion polarizability, gives us 40 kilohertz, which is about half of what we're running right now with GLUEX at 90% lifetime. So it should not uh, be a big problem. Uh, the measurement consists in uh, uh, measuring the exclusive production of two pions off of a lead target. And the lead target produces uh, a source of virtual photons so that we can uh, measure the gamma gamma to pi zero pi zero cross section. 
The number of events expected is based on some early measurements in 1990 by Crystal Ball, and just folding in the expected flux, target, acceptance, and so on, and 20 days of approved beam time, we would expect a total of 1,800 signal events. But we know that these experiments really hinge on the backgrounds, and there are two important backgrounds uh, that we expect. Uh, one is the nuclear coherent production of two pions, mainly through the production of the F0500, or also called the sigma meson. The pi zeros in, uh, are produced inside the nucleus, or are strongly suppressed by Pauli blocking and absorption. Uh, this suppression has been seen in the Primex uh, experiment. It's expected to be stronger for two pi zeros. Nevertheless, we've adjusted our background estimates based on the uh, Primex experiment. Uh, we also expect misidentified backgrounds. The most important one is the production, the coherent production of etas, which have a large branching fraction to three pi zeros. Something like 1% of the time, the eta is reconstructed as a two pi zero state, and that would fake the signal. Uh, might mention some uh, uh, advantages compared to the charge uh, uh, experiment. One is that there's no rho zero production that decays the pi zero pi zero, and we don't have to worry about mu plus mu minus background. In addition, single pi in exchange is forbidden due to CP conservation. So we've done a, a complete uh, simulation of the expected events with Jayant and going through the detector acceptance. Uh, and this is shown in the black points in these plots. Uh, the other points are the result of an amplitude fit to uh, extract the different components in the, in the data. And if you focus on the top right plot, uh, you can see that the scattering angle of the two pion system for the a signal, which is shown in red, dominates the distribution. This is very typical for Primakov reactions. You can see it's easily distinguished from the background. You have a minute left. Okay, thank you. Um, so this allows us to kind of uh, estimate the errors. The statistical error comes directly from the fit. We expect the cross-section uh, error on the cross-section to be 5%. And with an estimate from Diane Pennington, this translates into an error on the polarizability of 39%, which maybe sounds like a fairly large number, but in terms of absolute errors, it's pretty small. You can compare it to the compass result and the projected CPP uh, errors. The answer for, or the error for the neutral pion is about 0.8 in these units, and it's very comparable to the other experiments. So this shows the uh, uh, cross-section as a function of the dipion mass. You can see the projected uh, points in red. Uh, that includes both statistical and systematic errors. You can see we have good precision, especially at the threshold, which is important for extraction of the polarizability. Uh, also shown are the data from crystal ball from 1990. So in summary, uh, NPP, will measure the pi zero polarizability for the first time. We realize that it's a big uh, effort uh, on the part of uh, theoretical effort to kind of extract the polarization from the cross-section measurements. We've been working with uh, uh, many theorists that have uh, supported us in the proposal listed here. Um, and they're, you know, promised to see us through to the very end. Uh, we've uh, simulated the primary backgrounds of the experiment, and with uh, those backgrounds, we expect the uncertainty in the cross-section gamma gamma to pi zero to pi zero to be on the order of 5%, leading to an uncertainty in the uh, polarizability of alpha minus beta of about 40%. And with this uh, relative uncertainty, the projected absolute uncertainty is really uh, very comparable to other measurements for uh, charge pions and the proton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Steve Deitman is the reader of this proposal. Steve, would you like to ask anything? Not really. Uh, this is very fine, Elton. Uh, we've discussed this 
over the last year a couple times. I just wanted to make sure I understood one thing. Your triggers is not on based on specific multiplicity of photons. It's based on total energy. So I guess uh, I'm guessing that you would get a sample of one, two, three, four, five, six photons in your sample. Yes, this you're you're correct. It's a total energy trigger. So um, essentially, all the beam energy gets translated into photons for the signal, and you just add it all up. Um, and so, yes, in the data sample, we would have any any events that satisfy that energy threshold. Okay, good. Because that, that may be important because uh, some. You'll be missing photons here and there, and so uh, you'll have to understand the three photon sample pretty well. Indeed. Uh, and important to note is that we will also be triggering on the single pi zero production, and we can use that as a normalization tool. No more questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Then we uh, go to the last presentation of this session. I a, can I have a question? Yes, please. Um, why did you consider, I mean, lead is always sort of the the default choice for Primakov, but then you buy yourself a lot of uh, conversion and radiation length. So it would be, I think, good to have, comp to have also runs with nickel as a target in order to understand systematics of extracting the Primakov from the coherent nuclear scattering and to, to see the effect on conversions and radiation length. Uh, yeah, this has been discussed. Um, I mean, being that this is a first measurement, we think that, you know, our emphasis is really looking at the uh, important just to see the signal first and make sure we understand that and the systematics of under of subtracting things underneath the signal. Um, would be kind of a second stage. Thank you very much. Then I call on the last speaker of the session, that's Marco Battaglieri, who will uh, present several Rhine group editions for Hall A. Marco, I suggest you uh, aim for eight minutes and I will give you a two minutes warning. Okay. Hi everybody. Oh, sorry. No, I start sharing. Can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, I'm gonna go in full presentation mode. Okay, so I'm reporting about the three uh, run group addition for class 12. So let me start uh, with the first one: is the nuclear TMDs in class 12 as an addition of run group D. And as we'll, well known, uh, we'll try to explain a nuclear effect uh, like EMC, for instance, as a manifestation of quark in nuclei, but uh, attempts so far were not very successful. So how to move forward? There are mainly two options. One is to run uh, high precision data, and this is the way that uh, we are following the whole A and C here at Jefferson Lab, or look for new processes like, for instance, tagging uh, like uh, short range correlation or in particular nuclear uh, DVCS or TMDs. Uh, nuclear TMDs in some way can be seen as a modern approach to nuclear CDs with a microscopic description uh, of uh, nuclear effect and also uh, deformation of fragmentation function in medium. So uh, existing data date back to the Hermes uh, time. You see here the adron absorption and uh, also the uh, trans uh, transport co coefficient that show a, a sizable effect on different uh, nuclei and different uh, parts particles. Um, not much development in theory from, from that time, so it's, uh, it's time to add the new data to uh, also to boost uh, the research. And the way how TMD will be extracted is quite similar to uh, the standard TMDs on nucleon with different modulation of cross-section terms. Uh, it may be complicated, obviously, by convolution with fragmentation functions uh, and also uh, um, 
uh, on the right side you see here modulation of some phi uh, that both shape and uh, strength that may provide uh, inform independent information on, on the transport coefficient and uh, uh, also the broadening of the PMDs within the nuclear medium. So the experimental setup uh, of this experiment uh, will make use of the large acceptance of class 12 uh, with spin zero target to avoid any spurious effect like carbon and, uh, and tin. Um, the um, addition of RGD has already secured 60 days in standard, let's say, nuclear target configuration. The only addition that is requested by this specific uh, experiment is the polarization uh, that require, that is kind of routine for uh, uh, all the operation, but require also some, some time to measure polarization. Results are reported on the on the right side based on realistic estimate on the full chain of the analysis chain we have, and you can see that uh, this is the first time uh, measured this modulation in sun phi and cos phi. And anyway, whatever we are going to measure will be interesting. Any a dependency in case or other other things. So obviously, this is also uh, important to, to mention that uh, having uh, a, a broad uh, um, program on Proton, uh, the, uh, the systematics uh, will be in some way uh, controlled. The second uh, addition is the diagonals from a longitudinally polarized target. And again, we are talking about uh, uh, TMDs in this case, uh, both in terms of uh, collinear PDF, but also fragmentation uh, function for diagonals. And this obviously related to the spin momentum correlation and hadronization, where the new and the extra degree of freedom uh, brought by uh, the second hadron will provide um, other observables to be included in the analysis. As you can see, the twist three, um, we, I mean, using this, uh, um, this approach, you can have information about the twist three uh, collinear PDF, in particular HLH, um, that provide new information uh, on uh, other, uh, other structure function of the, of the, uh, of the nucleon. Um, in particular, um, a priori, there is no reason to consider that these structure function need, are, uh, you know, in some way at least for u cork will be the same size of E, providing a sizable and, and visible uh, effect. Uh, together with that, uh, since the measurements uh, will uh, uh, provide many other observables, so the double spin asymmetry, for instance, uh, uh, provide information on uh, diadron fragmentation function D1, for instance, and a careful uh, partial wave analysis of these uh, uh, new observables will provide also information on the two hadrons emitting in the different waves, uh, providing more insight on how uh, the, the mesons uh, interact uh, within, uh, uh, within the, the nucleus in some way. Again, linking, if you like, uh, the Mason uh, language to the uh, uh, PDF language. Um, other uh, uh, information are re uh, related to subleading to his contribution that are uh, not only interesting per se, but also helps in extracting uh, the, other, uh, the other structure function. And uh, together with that, also fracture function and many other observables that are possible, uh, that are accessible uh, with this uh, new measurement. Again, some exploratory measurement in class six, but obviously here we are talking about an extended kinematics. The experimental setup used by the experiment will make use of, of run uh, uh, group C polarized uh, longitudinally target on NH3 and ND3 with a, a, a sizable polarization, as we discussed this morning, um, and uh, uh, is aiming to, uh, I mean, the general, the run group uh, is aiming to um, measure the nucleon spin structure, DVCS, and single hadron. So the diadron seems to be a kind of natural extension. And again, here reported the the um, possible error bars on HLA, HLA uh, um, of X uh, uh, with 120 and 60 days on, on uh, um, hydrogen and, uh, and uh, deuteron targets, together with also some exploratory measurement for G1 and P. You have two um, minutes left. Yes, okay. Uh, the last uh, addition is the diadron measurements in electron scattering nucleus, so something similar, but in this case, uh, the focus uh, will be on the, on the double ratio. Uh, and again, this will be the first measurements of diadron angular correlation in nuclear DIS, complementing what has already been proposed for a single hadron. Uh, data again are dating back from Hermes time. You can see here uh, that there are uh, a low Z enhancement and no dependence on A that is quite, uh, um, quite strange. And actually, if we compare data with preliminary uh, data analysis from class six, uh, you see that there is kind of clash 
while in this case, a class show a, a better, I mean, dependence on A of, of this parameter and uh, also uh, a, a larger suppression. Um, that is quite well reproduced by the model, uh, JIBU uh, model. Um, the other interesting thing is that uh, uh, having a multi uh, multi um, parameter uh, information like for instance looking at these variables as a function of the pion mass is not showing a strong presence of the row as you may naively expect in the two hadrons emitted so again uh, showing that uh, is really necessary to go in a wide kinematics uh, to access the full information um, another thing that was to be mentioned is the hadronization uh, uh, in nuclei is one of the pillar of the EIC uh, science, uh, and uh, given the, uh, the not uh, too strong dependence on the kinematics of this uh, particular for the, for the uh, uh, transport coefficient, uh, you can see here that uh, uh, having any information from class 12 will be very useful for the EIC physics. Again, experimental setup will rely on the 60 days already secure from RGE, uh, experiment uh, with no special trigger requirements. And again, on the right side, you see uh, the kind of uh, results that proposed is just a, a little sample so, uh, <clears throat> of the huge uh, and, uh, and uh, many different variables that can be accessed by this uh, new measurement. Okay, so in summary, there are three class 12 uh, run group additions uh, aiming to measure TMDs in nuclei. Uh, diadron asymmetry with long, longitudinally polarized nucleons and diadrons in nuclei uh, to go after new asymmetries, never measure, or a tiny effect that are visible a lot square, like twist three collinear PDF, for instance, uh, and also multiplicity ratio in a white key. has been scrutinized and endorsed by the class collaboration, and they are really trying to extend their proven uh, uh, current uh, physics program that is leading uh, CDs, uh, TMDs on nucleon, now uh, making the best use of class 12 detector and already approved in time. The only uh, uh, particular, let's say, request is about uh, polarization for the uh, RGD that was not originally included, but this seems to be, again, kind of a natural request since uh, all experiment uh, in uh, all the are using polarized electron. And again, let me uh, conclude saying that uh, the experience uh, based on class six uh, data mining showed that uh, really having an open trigger stimulated a significant interest in community that uh, was much uh, uh, over the original scope uh, of the uh, of the uh, thought measurement. So in this case, is a kind of natural evolution of what we already proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have different readers for the different parts. Um, Elke, would you like to start with questions? Yeah, thank you very much for the nice summary. Um, for the nuclear effect, so uh, to really understand, of course, nuclear effects, you always have to compare uh, to the proton or deuterium data. And my question is twofold. So uh, do you have a good understanding of the acceptance corrections you have to apply? to really kind of uh, get uh, to the TMDs in the nuclear case, and then also on the radiative corrections for the nuclear case, and how they actually kind of compare to uh, your corrections you have to apply for the proton or the deuterium. Yeah, uh, for sure, the, from the point of view of the acceptance, uh, there have been, for instance, proposed uh, in one of the experiments uh, um, to use a dual target in order to measure at the same time uh, the deuteron and the nuclei in a way that you can have a one-to-one -one comparison exactly to minimize this effect. Um, obviously, it is not always possible, uh, and uh, uh, if you rely on hydrogen targets and, and the knowledge on, on, uh, on the single nucleon, uh, for instance, for the for the TMDs program, this will be valuable to extract information on nuclei, and we are mainly relying on, on obviously systematics will be different, and they, they needs to be uh, taken into consideration. Um, as far as uh, as uh, radiative correction, this is uh, obviously one of the uh, critical issues, in particular for uh, semi inclusive uh, deep university scattering, uh, whatever I mean on nucleon or nuclei. And uh, there is a strong program at JLab uh, to face uh, this problem. Actually, in collaboration with Duke University, we already started uh, uh, a strong collaboration exactly to uh, tackle this problem because we know that uh, this 
may affect uh, significantly our measurement. And again, the idea is to start with, uh, uh, with the nucleon, so uh, trying to have a, a good understanding of data and interpretation of data in the simplest case, and then move to nuclei, where obviously there, are, there may be other effects uh, uh, tied together that may in some way wash out uh, uh, the, the uh, information that we want to extract. So it's, uh, it's obviously a work in progress uh, that relies on uh, uh, a continuous interaction with theory that is evolving very rapidly in these years. So, so uh, I don't have, let's say, a final answer. I'm just saying that there is a huge community very interested in these measurements. So I think that uh, is a kind of service we are doing to the, to the community. Okay, thank you. Then, Marcus, we can move on. Yes, thank you. Uh, then, Alessandro, would you like to continue with questions? Well, uh, Marco, um, just a question on the diadron uh, uh, TMD measurements. One of the problems uh, with all uh, GLAB experiments, but e even more for diadron observables, is uh, to be looking at the current fragmentation region, uh, and uh, that you are not uh, that you can apply a partonic uh, uh, interpretation is there something you can do from the experimental side to help uh, be sure that we are uh, interpreting the data in the right way uh, i i completely agree uh, this is again a general problem not only for uh, uh for these specific measurements with the polarized uh, target but mainly for any diadron measurement uh, on the other hand, it's clear that the only way to disentangle the different effect uh, is to look at data. So what uh, uh, the, the plan in this case for at least the approach that we have in whole B is to really measure a wide kinematics. In this way, you can uh, hope at some point to see where effects are dominant and based on the kinematics separate the different effects. This is the only uh, the only approach that uh, again is a phenomenological is not based on on theory since uh, again we don't know exactly when uh, the different assumption may may be valid so the only thing is to look at the data and and try to to interpret them um, maybe also using more precise information uh, from uh, uh, cross section measurements in the other holes so that will be limited in kinematics but m more precise in error bars and the putting together the different information DDA is to have a, a comprehensive and coherent picture of uh, of the diadron uh, production in uh, uh, in the series uh, uh, measurement. Thank you, Marcus. I'm, I'm okay. Thank you very much. Then uh, the questions uh, uh, remaining uh, would be by Shu Fang. Shu Fang, please go ahead. Shufang, I cannot hear you. Can anyone uh, else hear Shufang? No, I can't. No. Can any of the moderators help? I've tested two things aside from maybe typing in the questions or logging out and coming back in. Those are my two best suggestions. If you can hear us, would you like to log out briefly and log in again? Left. And back. Uh, yeah, can you guys hear me now? Yes, Hello? now we can yeah. hear you. Please go ahead. Sorry, yeah, okay. we, we did not hear you from the start, so I think you have to just uh, start uh, yeah. from the beginning. Okay, okay, sorry about that. Uh, could you please move your slides to the last slides for the for the last one group, where you showed the the comparison prediction for the uh, no, actually not this one, the one before that. Yep. No. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So so I see you compare the the class six results with 
the predictions for GIBUU program, and then you use that the same programs to make prediction for the class 12. But if I look at the comparison between the curves and also the class 6 data, it's uh, not, I mean, the generic trend kind of fits, but otherwise not really, right? I would say it kind of describes the data qualitatively, but not quantitatively. I mean, say, for example, if you compare the orange and the green, it looks like the the orange line is always kind of below the curve and the green kind of always above the curve kind of-ish. So, so I'm just wondering, is there any improvement you're going to do for that code so that it can uh, explain the data better or make the prediction better? Or you kind of just use this code to give an indication of roughly where the measurement you guys expect to see? So I um, I can tell you that uh, I, I was quite impressed uh, by the fact that G, uh, GIBU model is reproducing, for instance, an A dependence mm -hmm. that uh, our mass data, data didn't show up. Mm -hmm. This is already, you know, something. I completely agree that this is only qualitative, uh, but on the other hand, uh, they seem to go, let's say, at least in the right direction. For instance, the other very interesting things is the uh, di uh, dipion mass, where you naively may expect uh, the row uh, dominance uh, uh, that is not uh, reproduced uh, uh, neither by the data nor by the, the model. So I would say that uh, this is a good starting point, uh, not probably the end, uh, was used to extrapolate the results uh, for uh, the, the uh, you know, for, for the prediction for class 12 uh, um, kinematics, but obviously this requires much more refinement to be uh, yeah, to, to really show an, a, a, a quantitative agreement with, the, with data collected. And again, say for TNDs, that uh, only if you measure different observables in different uh, kinematics, I mean, in a wide kinematic space, you can constrain the model. The model is just a transport model, so it's, uh, it doesn't contain uh, 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 the, the uh, I mean, not, com not fully contain a partonic uh, uh, um, a modification in medium, uh, but still describe pretty well data, and it's quite impressive to see that the class six, uh, uh, I mean, again, compared to Hermes, uh, are, are well reproduced. I, I, let's say are qu qualitatively reproduced. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, and also is uh, for the measurement, for, for this angular correlation that you guys measure, is there any plan of, you know, connecting with the theory community so that they can make best use of the results to maybe, you know, help for the, for the theory side as far as, you know, the, the, the models, the model, hydronic models on all code nuclear effect models goes? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. This is another, obviously, this is another, you know, big uh, uh, item uh, that uh, uh, obviously the analysis uh, of the of the uh, transport coefficient uh, needs to always be in some way related to the deformation of uh, of PDF within the nuclear medium. Then you have to take into account uh, both of them at the same time to have a coherent picture. So uh, yes, uh, we we definitely. Uh, want to uh, provide that this information uh, to, and again, um, I think that the correlation of the two hadrons in these specific measurements will provide new insight that, that was never measured. So again, something that completely new uh, attenuation of uh, of the two mesons emitted by by the nucleus. Uh, with uh, uh, if you look at the correlation, for instance, you can you can have a completely different uh, uh, conditions. One of the two hadrons uh, uh, goes undergoes uh, uh, interaction in the nuclear medium, while the other one may be emitted, uh, you know, almost free, almost in uh, in uh, as uh, uh, in in vacuum. So again, all, putting all together, the the hope and the idea is to have more insight and translate it in a quantitative uh, constraint for models and have a better understanding of, uh, of the different process. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think I'm good. No more questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Then uh, we close this uh, open session. The next open session uh, will be the closeout tomorrow. Until then, goodbye to all participants, and the PAC will reconvene in closed session now. Thank you. Bye-bye.